a question, please. Um, governments, when they uh, when they come, uh, they have, I, I would say, in different, especially in Germany, governments are very much controlled by economic forces. And uh, let's say ACTA and uh, uh, all the music industry is uh, pressuring governments to make rules about peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, download and so on in their own way. So uh, what do you think about this kind of relations? I mean, empowerment is nice, but, but there are uh, political and, and, uh, and uh, very strong economical forces that are working together to stop uh, empowerment and whatever can happen uh, with uh, this innovative and disruptive technology. What I would say is that the internet doesn't change the political economy of technology policy making altogether. Big companies with an interest in policy changes to shape markets to benefit their shareholders will continue to be influential. What's interesting to me about this internet moment is that for the first time in the history of media and technology policy making, they're not the only ones at the table. The Actifight that you mentioned, which I also saw in the US we had with SOPA and PIPA, two similar uh, types of bills that were moving through the Congress, which were also defeated by an interesting grassroots movement. This kind of a political constituency was never there before. If you look back in history at the formation of the the policies that created the, the broadcast industry, first in the 1930s around radio, and then in the 1950s around television, and then in the 80s around cable and satellite. The companies were the only players at the table, and they leaned on government, and they essentially created a structure of policies that benefited their interests. And it was almost a wholly commercial system, except for uh, when there were extraordinary circumstances this is the first time in history where we've had a policy making moment to shape a new media environment where there was somebody else there. That's not to say those companies won't continue to be powerful, but now there is a new, there's a new force. There's a new political constituency that makes its voice heard and that is potent. The idea that Hollywood could be defeated on these issues is really quite remarkable. Um, I've been in this business for about 10 years. I've never seen anything like that. And it, it was really a, a wake-up call in Washington that the game, has, the rules have changed a bit. They're not altogether changed, but for the first time, we've all got to reckon with uh, a new political constituency. And I think that's very interesting. You could say your name and tell us what your background is. Uh, hi, uh, Chris Pynchon from Choke Point Project, which is a project um, which is monitoring global censorship. Uh, you mentioned that the, the Julian Assange WikiLeaks, when that happened, you know, people began to wake up, or it was a shock to the system. With the result of the asylum bid today, how do you think that will affect uh, policymakers? W w will the asylum bid today with with, with Julian Assange? Will the uh, outcome of what has happened today, will that make them more, you've got to stop this, you've got to control this? What, what effect will it have? Do you mean specifically with his asylum bid or in general with, well, with government's that, just attitude? That, just that that's the, the kind of flashpoint today and it's a, it's a huge, you know, it's a huge thing. I think, I mean, difficult to speak about many governments and how they are looking at the situation. My feeling is that, Governments are not that interested in Julian Assange personally any longer. They are interested in what he represented. The WikiLeaks phenomenon as radical transparency in government processes and the need to reckon with the power of networks and the involvement of millions of people in what used to be decisions that were taken behind closed doors. So I think that governments are dealing with that recognition in different ways. Some are dealing with it by trying to expand the participation and openness and transparency of their governing processes. Some are answering that, that problem by investing millions and millions of dollars in surveillance technologies and trying ever harder to control the information systems. I think there's a, the, the major ideological conflict 
is, is no longer between left and right or global north and global south, that the major emergent ideological conflict is between open and closed. And I think that will be something that we'll be watching over the course of the next decade emerge quite publicly. Hi, my name is Judith Mühlhoff and I'm a user researcher. And I'd like to know what do you think about liquid democracy? About what? Liquid democracy. <laughs> so, I think that liquid democracy, from what I know about it, and I'm not uh, an expert in, in, in particular about the, the German context, but I have seen similar processes happen in other places. It, it is an experiment in what you, what you could do in this new world of distributed power. If you take at face value all the things that I presented of all of, of, all of the benefits and possible opportunities of the, of the internet as a policy making tool, then it follows that you should include everyone equally at the same time. And to me, liquid democracy is one of those kinds of experiments to see what happens when you try to implement a system which is consistent with the values that you say you believe in. And I think in some cases it is incredibly refreshing and interesting and you get views at the table that are usually not represented. And other times it is sclerotic and paralyzing and you have a hard time getting any agreement towards uh, a positive policy proposal. And I think as we as political organizations become more familiar and experienced with using the internet as participatory tools, we'll get better at it. And, and we'll be able to use these kinds of tools more effectively to get more people into the policy making process. Hi Ben, um, let me... Um, ask you a question that is related to the, the work that we are doing in the current initiative. And that is um, almost a paradoxon, we, we think. And that is we're talking about um, steering innovation, right? Innovation governance. There, there's some uh, scary things that uh, might happen with technology. As um, you've pointed out, that's a perspective that um, is, is quite present here. There's also lot, lots of opportunities that you want to foster and actually promote and, uh, and try to make them happen. Um, <clears throat> in, um, in, it's one of the essential um, paradigms of the internet that it allows innovation without permission from the edges, right? Uh, if you'd asked uh, a telco whether they wanted uh, Skype to be invented, I guess um, we all know the answer, right? So how, what's your take on um, understanding and steering innovation or is the best thing for policymakers basically to um, have a post hoc approach and look at things once they're out there or... Um, what, what do you think is the right um, approach here? So, you may take away from my talk that I am against regulatory intervention, but I think that it would be more precise to say that I'm against a particular type of, re of regulatory intervention, and I'm actually very much in favor of a separate type, and I'll, I'll describe the two types, and I think this is where steering comes into place, because I think you've got to steer policymakers away from bad regulation and steer policymakers toward good regulation. <laughs> and, and trying to differentiate the two is a trick. So here's how I would differentiate them. Bad regulation is, I see a market problem that is essentially a symptom of a structural imbalance in, in, in either in the marketplace or that's a legacy of old technology. So for example, telcos being concerned that over the top voice is going to compete with their traditional landline voice services. That's a structural problem. To deal with that structural problem by saying, okay, we're going to make a specialized rule just for Skype, that's a bad idea. We did that in the US. <laughs> It was a bad idea. We made VoIP specific rules. And instead of saying, you know what, VoIP is the beginning of a larger phenomenon of over the top services, we said, no, VoIP is sort of like traditional telephone services. And so we're going to bend the rules and sort of call it traditional telephone service in order so that we can keep the current model. Those are, that's a bad idea. 
because you, you're not solving for the root causes of change, the disruptive change, you're just addressing a symptom of those root causes. The right kind of regulation to me is to say, okay, what kind of market is emerging? And how do we put in place baseline policies which don't have to be reevaluated every six months when a new technology comes along, which are based on the idea that there need to be fair opportunity for all players, whether that player is commercial or non-commercial, whether that per player is political or personal. This is where I would say you have issues like network neutrality, baseline privacy protections, data protection rules. You can establish policies at the level of principle and say, look, we need to have across the market in this new structure, these are the values we need to make sure are informing our policies. Now, it's really challenging to figure out how to implement even a, a values-based policy in a structural way, but that's the right set of questions to be asking. Rather than saying, what are we going to do about Facebook? We should be saying, what are we going to do about any business that comes along that's business model is based on the user data that, that it gets from all the activity on the platform? <coughs> and I think right now we're sort of in between these two environments and there's not a lot of clarity as to how policymakers should end up on one side of the line or the other. We can steer them. You can steer them. Okay, uh, Carsten Schiefner, domain name system worker. Uh, I would be interested in, interested in your viewpoint on the WICKET, the World Conference on International Telephony, and the upcoming role, whether uh, there should be, in the bypass thereof, uh, there should be more control uh, on the internet or over the internet in terms of the ITRs, the international uh, uh, transit regulations. And I mean, the US have a pretty clear view on that. Uh, other countries have a completely different view on that. So what is your personal viewpoint on how we, uh, what kind of results can we expect uh, after, uh, when is it November, uh, after November this year? So let me start by giving a little background about your question so that everybody who's not familiar with the wicket and the vast complexity of internet governance can get on the same page. Basically, for the entire history of the internet, the network has been governed by a combination of mostly private sector institutions who set technical standards and assign domain names and manage the .de or the .com or the .uk. And remarkably, it's been relatively successful and it's managed to create a global network that is that rapidly integrated into our economic and social lives. In recent years, more and more internet users are not located in developed Western countries. They're located in undeveloped or developing Global South countries. And for the first time, those governments are taking an interest in internet policy because it matters for the first time because their people are online. And as a result, they're facing some of the problems that we have all identified in internet governance, whether it's cybersecurity or inter network interconnection and our privacy, all of these questions that every government deals with. And many governments are accustomed when they think about international communications policy to go to the International Telecommunications Union, which is the UN organization which has uh, always governed traditional telephone services. And there's a big debate now about whether the International Telecommunications Union should expand its mandate and take on responsibilities for internet governance that have previously been held by these private sector institutions. And the US government has taken the position that this is a very bad idea. And the reason is somewhat counterintuitive. The reason is that if the ITU decides to take on responsibility for internet governance, the ITU itself doesn't decide what those policies look like. The ITU is a treaty organization that's driven by its member states. And if its member states decide to do something that the vast majority of engineers in the internet world believe is a bad idea, it doesn't matter because it's a one country, one vote system. And there are many countries who would like the ITU to take control over internet governance, in part to approve, validate, and support their national level policies of censorship, 
content control and surveillance to approve and validate their desire to change the standards and protocols of the network to serve the domestic business interests in their countries. And there's a parade of bad outcomes that people are worried about. Are those outcomes necessarily going to happen? No, but they could. And there's a lot of political back and forth about what the meaning of ITU governance of the internet might be. Meanwhile, there's a lot of mis misunderstanding and the lack of understanding about what the existing institutions that govern the internet actually look like and what they actually do and why the system that exists today has has emerged in the way that it has and why it works and my own view is that in this case Washington is mostly right that it probably is a bad idea for the, the International Telecommunications Union to get involved in internet governance because it's better left to engineers as it has always been than it is to be subject to a political process. That doesn't mean that there's no role at all for the ITU to play. And that doesn't mean that the problems that countries are identifying that they want the ITU to solve are illegitimate. Those problems are real. I think what needs to happen in Dubai, what needs to happen in other meetings that are that are hosted under the UN framework is a more open, transparent, and fact-based discussion about how internet governance actually works today, what the benefits are to the current system, what the risks are to changing that system and empowering the ITU to be the governor of the internet, and what the actual problems are that people want to solve. Because my guess is that if that kind of discussion were to actually happen, most of the problems that are identified would actually be solvable under the existing framework of private sector institutions that have long governed the internet. And that there would be a role for the ITU to play, but it wouldn't be an expansive one. And I'm not sure what will happen in the meeting at the end of the year. My guess is that Whatever happens, it will be the beginning of a very long process. You read in the newspapers that the UN is going to take over the internet as if this was going to happen tomorrow. Now, this is not the way the United Nations works. Uh, that doesn't mean we, can't, we shouldn't be concerned about it. It's a very important issue. It's a very big issue. And it's obviously one that is hard to explain. It's hard for journalists to render in a thousand words in a newspaper article. And I think that it's part of our responsibility as the internet community, as scholars and advocates and journalists and practitioners and business leaders, to become educators and to become educated ourselves about how the internet is governed and what are actually the right outcomes for the vast majority of internet users. That's a long-winded response to your question, but I hope was, in some extent, answered it. <laughs> Hello, Ben. Thanks for your interesting talk. My name is Marcus. I'm working for the Open Knowledge Foundation in, in Europe. And <clears throat> I'm interested in your perspective on open data, given that the United States have been pioneering opening up government and also opening up data of the government and public sector. And it just recently became a trending topic here in Europe. Um, well, I guess I just want to know, do you think it's actually fulfilling the expectations and promises uh, it, it's been given in the US about the value, <coughs> sorry, about the value of, of opening up data in, in terms of transparency and innovation? Um, or would you say, well, it's been a nice exercise, but the, the, the benefits have so far at least been like limited? I think it's sort of, the way you answer that question kind of depends on what your expectations were at the beginning. So I think that the Obama administration, at least in the United States, has done more to open up the governing process, done more to make the governing process transparent, to publicize government-owned data in a way that is responsible and, and um, designed for public service benefits than any previous administration put together. And that the benefits have been real. There has been a lot more public participation in the policy making process than ever before. It's uneven. On some issues it, it, it gets a direct response and on some issues it doesn't. And it can't overcome traditional political forces all by itself. But it is an important new player in Washington politics that wasn't there before. And I think that's a very big positive. 
Another positive that I see from what Washington has done on open data and open government is that it's become much bigger than Washington. Uh, the State Department, we were involved in a big project called the Open Government Partnership, which now has more than 50 countries involved. Uh, Germany is not one of them, interestingly. Some of you may be uh, involved in the, the local campaign to try to get them uh, more involved. But the Open Government Partnership essentially has, is about bringing governments together who are committed to openness, transparency, and accountability, committing them to the sort of criteria for m entry into this club, and then asking all governments who are members of the partnership to put forward plans for increasing transparency, accountability, and citizen participation. And what we saw essentially is that many of the world's leading governments in open data and accountability are not in North America and Europe. And that this information sharing and best practices development has been very valuable from a wide variety of perspectives and has led to governments taking steps towards openness that they would not have taken if they had not been a part of this process. So I think it's too soon to tell whether it's going to be transformative but I think it certainly made significant progress and, and almost all to the positive. Um, hi, my name is Nina Keim. I'm a um, political consultant here in Berlin and I also blog for um, America Welt. So my question is rather towards the upcoming American election. As far as I know, um, both the Republican and the Democratic Party have yet to uh, integrate a commitment to internet freedom in their party platforms. And I'd be interested in hearing from you what you think, um, why that is, that they have not yet publicly committed to internet freedom, and what impact in general internet policy could make or of, if it could be an issue in the campaign. I think that both campaigns will commit to internet freedom. The Obama administration has done so many different things on internet freedom that it's de facto uh, a part of the platform, whether it's officially in the Democratic Party platform or not. I, th I bet it will be by the time we get to convention. I think there'll be similar language in the Republican platform. What's interesting about internet freedom in particular as a technology policy issue is that it, it is not partisan. In, in a Washington environment where almost everything is partisan, and this is an issue that isn't. Now, politicians support internet freedom for different reasons but they all have gotten to the same outcome, or most of them have gotten to the same outcome. If you're uh, a, interested in, in the details of American politics and partisan politics with respect to internet freedom, there's a really interesting debate going on right now where there are, are two different declarations of internet freedom that have been issued by different coalitions of groups, uh, both of whom claim to be the real internet freedom. And what, well, this is frustrating to a lot of people who are involved in those campaigns to, because of the confusion that it causes to the public who are trying to understand what the heck is going on. I actually think it is a net benefit and it shows that there is a lot of interest and support for the main idea that networks ought to be open and that freedom of expression that we've traditionally supported in conventional media should extend to digital media. So I think those will be uh, supported by both parties I doubt they're going to play a significant role in the, in, in the voting booth this cycle just because uh, there are so many other issues on the table that divide the parties. Um, but it is interesting to the extent, the extent to which internet freedom is playing a role in discussions of foreign policy. You almost never hear an extended discussion of the Arab Spring without a discussion of internet freedom. You almost never hear a, an extended discussion of China policy without a discussion of internet freedom. And, and this is new, and I think is largely thanks to Hillary Clinton State Department and, and, and the Obama White House. Uh, hello. Uh, I'm here. Sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, my name is uh, Frank Beiersdorf, and I'm doing a PhD on uh, global information and telecommunication policy in the graduate program up the hill. And I um, worked for the last initiative of Collaboratory on Human Rights and Internet. I was a little bit surprised about your uh, description of um, policy, foreign policy makers in the US, considering the internet a dark and scary place. Because I know by coincidence that uh, for Germany, I think the um, 
embassies hired like a dozen people to work in social media in the last year alone. So I was um, a little bit surprised uh, uh, about your uh, take on that uh, the State Department is so conservative in this area. Or this might be uh, even a result of your work, I don't know. And uh, second exactly. question on that, <laughs> we, the second we, we question succeeded. on that is um, in how far um, does uh, the state uh, use the internet not to uh, create innovation, but just to sort of prolong information policy, public relations, or dare I say, use a propaganda word. Uh, so, so I would be just curious on your take on that. Thank you. So to answer your first question, what you're seeing now in terms of US foreign policy and the use of new media and in particular social media as tools of communications is entirely new. And it is a result of a long and successful, ultimately, effort to change the culture of the State Department. Now, it helped us greatly that Hillary Clinton said, you're going to do this whether you like it or not. But ultimately, most people came around. And they, they really have, have internalized and institutionalized the use of new media as a part of our diplomatic communications. Um, the first response of a lot of foreign policy experts when you talk about the internet as a tool of communications, they say, this is great. We can now get our message across to more people. And most of the people who they want to reach are saying, yeah, great, more propaganda. Uh, it's not enough that I have to hear it on the airwaves. Now I'm going to get it on the internet too. I think that that's a simplification and that actually if you look at the communications from most U.S. embassies, there's a really interesting mix of discussion taking place and a lot of what they're trying to do is not simply repeat the talking points from Washington, but actually engage different communities in the countries in which they live. And whether we've succeeded fully or not, a big part of what I tried to bring across to people in the State Department is that the most important thing about the internet as a tool of communications for diplomats is not that it extends our ability to speak. It's that it extends our ability to listen. Never before could we actually know what regular people in any country in the world think about any issue. And now you can. And if we're not listening, that's, 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 that's a failure on our part, because we are not as nuanced and understanding and sophisticated in our ability to deal with the relationship between the United States and another country if we're not aware of the views of as many different constituencies in that country as possible. And trying to get around this conventional notion that the role of the diplomat is to speak and to turn it around and say actually the role of the diplomat is to listen is another cultural shift that I think will take some time to, to take place.